Hi, everyone. It's Virginia Stanley along with Chris Connolly and Lainey Mays here for another episode of Door to Door, bringing you really cool books and authors. And uh, we've got a wonderful guest with us today. Um, Emily Danforth is here, author of Plain Bad Heroines, which many of you have heard all about. Um, she was a speaker, you were at the BEA with Jessica Williams and uh, uh, just tons of love for this book. Uh, this is a, a, a buzzy literary mashup of Gothic mystery, lesbian love, Hollywood, pop culture, feminist history, and horror. Sarah Waters calls it brimming from start to finish the sly humor and Gothic mischief. She calls it brilliant. I'm going to read one more quote and then turn it over to Lainey and to Chris. But Paul Tremblay, everybody's favorite horror writer, uh, says Played Mad Heroines is a queer roar and it's terrifying and it's a goddamn triumph. <laughs> yes. Emily Danforth, thank you so much for taking time to join us today. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm delighted that Paul is still getting my checks. So <laughs> <laughs> it's good to always <laughs> keep sending them and people will keep quoting him. <laughs> <laughs> So great. Well, I just, I, you know, I just want to say before I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Lainey and to Chris. Um, but it is, it's, uh, there's been such great response to this book and there's so much in it. And um, I, I bow to Chris and Lainey who have been so good about synthesizing this in a way without giving too much away. I never shut up, but those guys are great. And so with that, I turn it over to Lainey Mays to kick us off. Lainey? Thank you for being here, Emily. I, this book is just like larger than life. I mean, it is large physically, <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but it is larger than life. And I feel like, you know, I came in and I was like, this book, we have to talk about this book. And then Chris is like, oh my gosh, we need to talk about this book. We had to set aside whole time periods just to like <laughs> go through everything. And librarians are doing the same. People on Twitter are just like tagging us and stuff and saying how much they love it. And just having really fun with the reviews too. You yeah. know, like they, somebody said like, reader, you'll want to read this, you know, like oh, really nice. fun. Um, and so I just want to read a little of your book list starred review that's coming soon. We're so excited. Um, so they call it Sexy, Funny, Spooky Tale, Dark, Affectionate, Creepy, A New Classic in Queer Fantasy. And um, it goes on to say like the tone, uh, the ride knowing tone of the narrator and the queerness at its core and the illustrations all contribute to a suspenseful rush that will leave the reader flipping furiously till the end. And that's a stellar star review and you got a star publishers weekly review. And like, I can't even sit here and read all of the things that have come out. You know, it's been included in so many roundups, the book expo buzz book. You did that great panel with Jessica Williams, who's been on here with us before. And I don't know, how does it feel like to have all this stuff coming in? What's <laughs> the, I mean, that's probably setting you up for like a lot of emotions that you can't put into a sentence. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as, as is evident by my huge book, I can't put anything into a single <laughs> sentence. Um, but no, it feels, it feels really so exciting that people are getting this book. I wasn't sure. I think it's weird. I think it's a big, weird book. I, it, by intention, by design, it's supposed to be. And I, um, it took me a really long time to write, uh, you know, uh, years and years and I lost my way a bunch of times and so it's really really thrilling to think that um, some readers are responding this way and just really seem to get the humor and the horror and um, like the same stuff that I liked about writing it so yeah it's it's a delight. Yeah definitely I mean very funny but I had sometimes I was looking over my shoulder a little. I had some <laughs> I was talking to Chris there. about that. <laughs> Every time I hear a buzz I'm just <laughs> Um, so do you want to tell the viewers a little bit about the book? I know, again, a little bit about the book. It's so hard to sum up and not give anything away. Sure, and, and sure. No, I'll give, I'll give it my best shot. I'm getting better. It is an impossible test. But my, um, it, perhaps folks have already seen this, but my kind of joking, but not entirely joking tagline for the book is that it's a uh, picnic at Hanging Rock, if you're familiar with that, with that book or the film, uh, plus the Blair Witch Project times lesbians. Um, and I think that that is a you know, really simple way of, of maybe giving you some math to understand the book. Um, 
really, I think the easiest way to, to describe it is to say that it's divided into two time periods and it's about equally divided. And one of those time periods um, is turn of the century, roughly 1902. Um, and what we're doing is we're tracing the story of a cursed boarding school for girls in coastal Rhode Island called the Brocons School for Girls. And uh, part, of, part of that narrative is what the story of that curse is, but students are dying. And the thing that seems to link them is a particular copy of a very real memoir from 1902 called The Story of Mary McLean, which I imagine we'll talk a little bit about. Um, also their sapphic interest in other girls is maybe a thing that links them, but the book is the most direct link. And so that really is the story of, of the historic half of the book is tracing what's the curse and how is it affecting um, the characters who hold the copy of the book and discover things about it. And then if you flash forward about 100 years, the contemporary half of the story tells the making of a controversial queer film about that curse. And so it's the filmmakers involved, it's the actresses, and it's the writer of that book who is sort of a prickly queer character herself. Um, and really those two stories, I think of them as like a funhouse mirror. Uh, and, and I hope readers are having fun with this. Almost everything that happens in the historic plot has a kind of refraction in the contemporary plot in this sort of distorted way. And so there's, you know, there, you'll get a scene and you'll get a different version of that scene um, or a winking kind of nod to that scene in the, in the contemporary half of the book. And, and there's um, some evidence that the curse is maybe not over. So that, I think that's the clearest synopsis maybe of the, of the book that I can give. Maybe not clearest, but uh, briefest, briefest, <laughs> briefest. Yeah, yeah. Um, and no, when we have to present it in two minutes, I'm like, I, I, I don't know, just go, <laughs> go look it up. I can't, I can't put it in. Um, and so speaking of Mary McLean, do we wanna talk a little bit about historical, um, in, how you came to find out about Mary McLean and and why she was so important in this book? Sure. So yeah, I you know I'm a longtime um, reader and, and in some ways doing my graduate work scholar of queer fiction, sapphic fiction, um, specifically lesbian fiction, um, but was surprised that um, you know I was I was kind of older and done with my graduate work before I learned about Mary McLean and I read first read about her actually and I was looking at, up some history of Butte, Montana, which is this colorful mining town. Um, and had a really sort of like um, significant population and, and culture again turned the century and that's when Mary McLean was living and writing there and I learned about her and I think you know then I read about her in some other places and my first encounter with her was really as this you know she was um, a sensation right and I had the sense that she was larger than life um, she was 19 right when she wrote this memoir she sent it off it gets published it launches her into this kind of unbelievable stardom um, I think it, the book sold something like 80,000 copies in its first month month. There was a cocktail named after her, a baseball team, a cigar. Um, you know, she, she got a number of writing jobs and sort of speaking jobs, uh, but also was really derided in the press that the memoir was and, and kind of made um, whether she liked it or not, um, you know, the, the feature of article after article for months and months. But, but so I just had the sense of her as a sensation, right, which certainly she was. What I didn't expect, and I think this is really what speaks to how I use it in the book, is how much um, I would love her memoir when I read it. Right? I thought, well, she made a name for herself and she said some scandalous things in 1902. I think that the book absolutely, if you read it in 2020, and I hope that folks do, uh, is still funny. It's fresh. It's almost alarmingly contemporary. Um, there are sections that feel absolutely like you know a nineteen-year-old could be writing them about her experiences today. And I just loved her voice um, and her candor. Uh, and you know, there was I think the more that I read the book, I taught the book at one point, and it did not go over so well with students. They were pretty bothered by it. And so I, you know, there are a number of things, but it just felt like the book kept taking on her book kept taking on a larger and larger role in in my novel and um yeah i'm i'm delighted now that i hear from from readers already who are saying i didn't know about mary mclean and i'm seeking out her work that's so thrilling to me and could we talk a little bit so the horror genre which so like mary mclean she talks about the devil which obviously caused an uproar and i it's all kind of again centers around horror in a way whether it's real life horror at you know at, at people that that are like lifestyles that aren't approved or you know things like that could you talk about why horror was your preferred genre to approach this story 
Yeah. I mean, I think like a lot of, a lot of, not all, certainly my wife would say not me, but I think like a lot of queers have an affinity for horror. I was certainly a queer teen that did. And I, and I didn't have maybe the language to express it as, you know, a closeted queer teen in Montana, but I knew that I loved horror both because I sometimes sympathized and empathized with the monsters, right? I knew that the sort of the, the characters that were othered, um, but also just, I think um, I rooted for the final girls, right? I was a big fan of slashers and there was something very queer about the androgynous final girls of my favorite slasher movies. And um, it, it, there was a there was a kind of like I think like understanding of the way that horror looked at culture um, and and maybe you know my favorite horror films or my favorite horror novels um, again gave a kind of centering to to the other right and, and that I wasn't seeing in other kind of culture around me so I as a queer person always had affinity for for horror and I think that. I mean, there were, I, I've also just been a lifelong fan of Gothic fiction, right? And I think that there were so, there are so many tropes of Gothic novels that I wanted to play with and wink at and explore in this. I, I, I can't, I don't know that I can imagine having told the story in any other way. I mean, it, it, it just sort of didn't fit without those elements. So I don't know yeah. if that answered your question. It totally does. And, and I think and we were talking how this, this novel has, like the book that it's based upon has this way of, and kind of finding its way into your life in ways you don't expect and mm. kind of and, and and it is haunting it's it's entertaining hilarious often but um i think some of the best horror we were talking about picnic at hanging rock how it there's this subversive element to it and it really it, it does you just ha you're looking over your shoulder not just it for like a boogeyman but just like this unsettling of how you look at life it's really like a you know I, I, it's hard to describe, but it mm. is just an overwhelming sensation of, it's an experience. I, I, and again, Lainey and I were talking about it. We, it just, I'm, I'm lost for words. I guess Lainey, we're, <laughs> we're facing this again. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, if, could you talk a little bit about maybe some, you, you talked about slashers. Could we talk a little bit about, you know, we, I think we, you described this book as picking at hanging rock we talk about Blair Witch Project. Mm. Uh, and if you could recount the story actually about your own inspiration with uh, Blair Witch and, and your own attempt at that. Oh yeah, we were talking about this earlier. Yeah, I um, I don't, I mean, this was one of those things that I think was lodged, right? Like like for a lot of writers, it wasn't, it wasn't maybe sort of present at the forefront but was clearly lodged somewhere um, in my consciousness and, and bubbled up in ways that I didn't expect. But I, uh, there's a recurring theme and a sort of element within the book of these yellow jackets, um, these wasps that are terrorizing um, the students from the very first chapter. Um, and they're doing it, I think a number of things in the book, I won't talk about all of them. I think that's, Lainey, you said something about a buzzing, sort of buzzing sound, but um, I, I like, I, I, there is a found footage element to the book, certainly it becomes kind of a, it, it's a, it's an element of the plot, but I've always been really interested in found footage films. Um, I think they're really scary when they're done well. There's this question of um, found footage for me has always had a kind of meta element and this book is very meta. And so there's this sense of like how the story is being told and it, there's this kind of construction that's revealed to us, right? When it's found footage, we think we're more aware of how the story is put together. If something is found footage, we're seeing some of those seams, right? And we're thinking about well, why did I see this clip and not this clip and what's the apparatus around that? So, I, I, you know, there's this whole sort of uh, found footage piece but the Blair Witch Project was hugely influential to me, um, I think like to a lot of horror fans. And when I was a teenager and I was a lifeguard one summer um, and we were bored and a lot of us had seen the Blair Witch and loved it. We like, like teens across the country thought we would grab you know, a camcorder and make our own Blair Witch Project. We thought it would be that easy to do with no editing skills and no you know, <laughs> film skills whatsoever, but um, the hubris of youth. And so we you know, had some sort of convoluted slasher story and we're filming um, a chase sequence on the banks of the Yellowstone River and stepped into, several of us in this chase sequence stepped into a ground nest of yellow jackets and were chased into the river um, to get away from them. And that really, it, I, obviously it was there for me and, and clearly you can see the scene in the book that, that most mimics it, but it's not something that I think I was thinking about or writing toward. Um, it's, it's something that as I've talked about the book afterwards, I've really remembered. So yeah, I mean, I think that's how I write. That's not how all novelists write, but I know that all the kind of pieces um, from my life in these moments find their way, find their way into the, the pages. 
even sometimes when I don't want them to. Yeah. Well, let's talk about meta because so you just mentioned how meta it is, but you're juggling so many things in this book. And it's just like, I'm so impressed by how you fit it all in so intricately and perfectly. Like you have a direct address, you have like two main stories, but all these other stories coming in, which by the way, the end story, I could have had a whole other book about, but um, <laughs> you have, uh, got, it's got the core, you have a haunted house, and you also have satire. And then you also um, have these illustrations and footnotes. Like, what was it like trying to figure out how you're going to get them all? Like, did you write them separately, like footnote was? No, I think that I, um, it's why it took me eight years and all those starts and stops that I was telling you about, because I didn't know how to do it. And it, and it took a lot of wrong turns um, and, and thinking about it. I think most of them came more organically than that. The direct address really came partly because, again, utilizing Mary McLean's book, she's dir uh, directly addressing the devil, as Chris uh, referenced throughout the book. She's beseeching, really the devil again and again to come rescue her from her dull existence in Butte, Montana. You know, my kind devil, my charming devil. Um, and then also, I think, you know, certainly Victorian director dress, but there's, there's also something, and I've talked about this a little bit, I was reading a lot of, you know, the, the, the ghost stories of, of Edith Wharton and Henry James, these kind of turn of the century ghost stories. And there's a lot of, it's not what we would traditionally call, it's certainly not direct address, and it's not really even what we would call metafiction, right? We wouldn't sort of label it that way. But there's real pleasure taken on the page in those stories and acknowledging the act of the scary story being told. And, and you find it again and again and again, it's at the beginning of the turn of the screw, it's at the beginning of three or four of Edith Wharton's short stories, uh, ghost stories, where it's this kind of, we were all put in the mood for a ghost story that night. We were put in the mood for a scare. And there's this acknowledgement of the story then, you know, these folks in the drawing room that's going to be told, that's going to be the bulk of the story that we as the reader are reading. Um, and I love that. I mean, I love that since I was a kid, this kind of gather round, let me tell you a spooky, uh, a, a spooky tale. And so that's part of what the direct address I think is doing. I think, you know, some readers are just like, oh, Victorian direct address, right? I've read, I've read Jane Eyre. Um, but I had this other thought about kind of what, um, what maybe that was doing this, this it's, it's, uh, I think it's a, it's the storyteller, the narrator reminding you um, of this kind of communal experience of being told a spooky story. And of course, at, at the same time, in terms of its, its meta-ness, it's constantly reminding you that this is a story and you're being manipulated, right, to, to the narrator's ends. Um, and then there's a big part of the story that revolves around um, kind of a mother-daughter acting, not team, but they both are actors, one and older and one in the present, well. Sure the present, I guess. <laughs> um, and so why is it, why was it important to have like the movie element parallel to the book uh, throughout the book, like the Mary McLean book? Why did you want to do movies and book? Because Merritt feels really uh, protective of this story that she's written mm -hmm. and it's taking her a while to write another one. But you also have these elements of the movie making too. So sure, did you yeah. just want to... Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, um, you know, partly it was, it's my interest in adaptation, right? This other way of this, this whole novel is filled with ways of looking. Right. And, and I think that I take that very much from Gothic novels um, where we might, we might very much get lurking or kind of voyeurism. But again, it's, I think that that thing that I was describing a little bit at the beginning, this, this notion of everything that happens has a kind of fun house alternate um, within the book. And I think, um, uh, even the illustrations to some extent are, are this kind of reminder of this is one way of looking at it and here's another way. So Merritt's written her version of a supposedly right true story uh, that we're getting another version of and she's very sort of protective of that story even though she knows well maybe the woman that gave her a lot of the information about the story had her own reasons for why she was giving her that information. Uh, and then we have this director come in and these actresses and they have this other way of, of, of viewing and manipulating the story. And, and yeah, one of Merritt's kind of um, conflicts in, this, in the novel is figuring out what role she's going to take in that. And um, again, I think part of it too was just my love of horror films and found footage and thinking about again, how, when we tell these kinds of stories, you know, how much they change just, just given the way that we tell them. So, but again, it's that these kind of repeated acts of, of looking and the illustrations both feel period appropriate. They feel like a Gothic novel and Sarah Loudman, the, the, 
uh, illustrator was very inspired by boarding school kinds of, of novels um, and really looked at those for references. But also, you know, for me, it was this yet, yet another way of seeing these scenes because Sarah saw some of them so differently than I did. So that was a really fruitful collaboration to kind of, it was a joy to be working on her. She was sending me things even as I was still writing and that kind of changed even the way that I was looking at some things, so. Do you want to talk about that marriage that you like the marriage of the illustrations to the book how did that come to be because you said she's working on them before you're finished yeah Sarah so Sarah Lutman who uh who did the the illustrations uh contacted me um years ago and she contacted me you know just saying like I'm, I'm a fan of your first book if you ever want to collaborate on something and at, at that point I think we were thinking like a short story or an essay um, and I just didn't really have anything. I kind of put her off. I wasn't getting a lot of writing done. I was, I was you know, teaching and it was just sort of a busy time. And then I got back to this book because again, there were a lot of starts and stops and trying to figure out how to write this book. And I got back into it and I thought this, this book should be illustrated. I mean, this is, I mean, looking at these kind of boarding school novels for inspiration, um, it makes total sense that this, but it was such a big project, right? That I had no idea when she'd reached out to me via email saying, I'd like to illustrate a, you know, a short story that she would have any interest. Um, and luckily she was delighted and had all these ideas and, you know, came to the table with them. And so before we even, you know, took this to, to Jessica Williams, we already had the pack, we'd been working together for a really long time and um, had worked on different versions of things. And, and yeah, Sarah was seeing the characters, even like I said, in, in some cases, as I was writing them. So, and there's a number of, you know, sort of like filmmaking, there are a number of illustrations that didn't make the book that got left on the cutting room floor. But yeah, it was a delight. I can't, I can't kind of imagine the book without Sarah in that process. So another thing in this book that we have a lot of footnotes, yeah. footnotes and like everything in this book, the footnotes are doing more than one thing, more than you what you might expect at first glance. You wrote a great essay that's up on Edelweiss viewers. I'll share this in the comments about one, bad books, which and banned books. And I'd love to touch on that, but also footnotes and how, when you were looking for, you know, literature, sapphic literature, things that connected with you, you always had to look in the margins and yeah. in the footnotes and they're often hidden there. Could you talk a little bit more of that, more about that? Yeah, I think that's such a common experience for queer folks and, and certainly one that's changing, right? And, and has been changing. But I think this, this um, notion that we're told for so long that you know, you're really not in history or um, don't, don't take too contemporary a view of history, right? Your experience obviously is not akin to the experience of someone who lived a hundred years ago. So don't try to find it replicated. Um, often also the folks that were recording history weren't queer, right? And so there's you know, this kind of um, straightening maybe of history and in my own family, this is what I talked about a little bit. And, and I think, again, I tell this story just because I know that if it's in my own family, we can extrapolate that. And it's in all these other families, right? Um, and I've already actually had a couple readers say, I have some, I had something similar happen in my family, which doesn't surprise me at all. In my own family, I had a, a great aunt who, um, you know, she was sort of rendered to a footnote intentionally within that letter who had a, a, a trove of letters between um, um, she and a, a woman she had been dating um, or, or seeing in some capacity. Certainly you could tell from the letters that there was a romantic relationship uh, between the two of them. And I had a relative who, you know, I never had seen these letters who, who found them when they were cleaning out my, my great aunt's house after she died and, and took it upon herself to dispose of them to sort of, you know, again, erase that history. Um, so I think, again, this, this kind of act of looking into the margins or looking into the footnotes to, to see a Mary McLean and think, well, what does it mean when they say sensation? Maybe I should go read more about her. Maybe I should now read the book, right? Um, now, when I see Mary McLean talked about, because she's certainly been reclaimed even in the last decade, but certainly in the last, you know, 20 years ago or, or so, there's, there's been more. But, but now I often see bisexual right I see these sort of discussions before if you look at older footnotes it might be a sensation right the girl sensation from Butte Montana um, so some other thing and so that this idea that as a queer person I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to go read her book right I'm gonna have to go find that for myself um, and certainly the the footnotes um, in Plain Bad Heroines are doing some of that work where it might be an aside, it might be a kind of jokey reference or there might be something really significant to the story buried in one of those. And if you skip over it, you're gonna miss that and have some questions. Do not skip them, dear. Do not <laughs> skip. I know my, my mother, I think would be happy to. Like she's read the novel and she's like, well, you know, I, I found out I had to read the footnotes. I'm like, you did actually have to read the footnotes, mom. <laughs> 
Um, and so could we talk about, you know, bad, bad, banned books or bad books? Because sure. again, bad heroines, bad books. Again, you reference this in your essay. Uh, yeah, do you mind talking about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Mary McLean's book, not surprisingly, was banned uh, a number of places, but famously from her own hometown library, um, and then was put back in and there was controversy about that. But um, that was something I was aware of, you know, while reading it. Um, and I don't, I don't want to make this chronology too neat, but sometime after finding out about Mary McLean and her book, but before it has such a large role within my novel, my own first novel, uh, which was a YA book called The Miseducation of Cameron Post, which is a coming of age story about a queer girl from Montana uh, growing up in the 1980s and 1990s, was removed from a reading list uh, by a school board in Delaware. Um, and uh, that became kind of a, a controversy for that town and that area. Um, and there was a, kind of a lot of press about it and a great reaction from a local bookstore where they stocked all these copies of the book and you could, you could go in and get it. Um, but obviously reading about Mary McLean, uh, knowing the long, long sort of history of queer books being challenged or banned or removed from reading lists. Uh, and, and what happened in the case of my book is that the, the initial complaint did not mention the, the lesbian narrative, but after a freedom of information, I, they said it was about the language, that kind of baggy, the language in the book, but after freedom of information request, lo and behold, the initial complaint was all about the lesbian sexuality. In fact, the complainant called it a, a, um, a manual for teenage lesbian sexuality, which was funny. It was like, well, I could have written that. I didn't actually write that, but I'm sure that would have sold. Um, so at any rate, uh, you know, there's this long legacy that I was very aware of, of, of queer books being banned and challenged. Um, and I just, it really got me thinking about this idea of a bad book. What do we mean when we say a book is bad, right? And I think often folks mean that it's morally suspect. And of course, because I'm writing a Gothic novel, I'm thinking about all the other ways in which a book might be bad, right? What the, the, the book itself might carry a curse, that the book itself might have some sort of malevolent force that's being passed along to these students. And it was just too delicious a prospect not to take up in a gothic novel it just seemed perfect right the stuff of gothic lit <laughs> I love that yeah it was really cool to think of like a lot of the, these two women in the past and the historical part you know they're kind of navigating a world that's not built for them in a way but then you know there's some freedom with the the modern part of the story and I, I appreciate that that wasn't a big part of like it wasn't like anything to overcome the book itself was just kind of dark and scary so that was you know yeah. that it was beautiful thank you yeah. um so i know so we'll link to the podcast episode you did with your editor jessica williams in the comments but you had a really long list of fun um horror no uh, movies that you loved and so i don't know if you want to talk about like even books that have influenced you or just movies that people should watch if they've enjoyed oh, this book. so many um well if you haven't i mean i think rightly so in the in recent years partly because of the great um uh, adaptation shirley jackson's right uh, haunting of of hill house has has been kind of right uh, you know, I don't know that it ever went out of style, but I think people know it again in a way maybe they didn't. But if you haven't seen the original, The Haunting, right, the original film from the 60s, um, it's fantastic. It's so, so good. I'm not, I'm not talking about the one from the 90s with Catherine Zeta-Jones. I'm talking about, uh, it's just so, it's kind of the ultimate creepy haunted house film. It totally um, holds up. It's very queer. Um, it's gothic. It's just a delight to watch. So if you have, for whatever reason haven't seen that yet, I think it's available all over the place and I would recommend it. Um, I also really love Peter Straub's Ghost Story, which is a big famous horror novel from the 70s that also has a kind of metafictional right, element to it with the story that the Chowder Society is telling and the way that's affecting life um in in that town and so um it's i loved that story i came to it obviously really late um decades after it was published but i uh delighted in it i was thrilled to find it and um, found myself rereading it a lot and it's maybe one of those books that i sometimes talk to contemporary readers of horror and they're like oh yeah i keep meaning to read that and they haven't rediscovered it so um and maybe a little bit less expected. I also just read Mexican Gothic, um, which is really recent and so good um, and smart so and really good. fun. It was really fun. I just had such a good time with it. So that's a more recent horror novel that I would recommend. Um, gosh, there's so many. And then, I, you know, you, no surprise from this book and what we've talked about. I've always loved the combination of humor and meta in my horror. And so, of course, um, Blair Witch Project isn't really funny, but it's 
kind of the ultimate found footage um, horror movie. But also long kind of, um, I think mocked, but one of my favorite, favorite slasher films from the 80s is called April Fool's Day. And it's teens and they're on an island. And this all seems like you probably think, yes, of course, they're, it's spring break and they're, they're on one of the one of the families is sort of you know wealthy and this the kind of New England island and they go there for a break and one starts dying after the next but there's a big sort of metafictional twist in it that a lot of horror fans at the time did not like I think it was actually once called the horror movie that ended the slasher franchise which is silly I loved it I ate it up um, I love the sort of the final characters and that I loved the twist um, the entire apparatus of that film was really one of my favorites and then. I, I couldn't not mention Scream, um, which has been mentioned everywhere, but it certainly, um, to the point of like it, you know, being satire now, um, it, it very meta, very scary, sometimes funny um, and super influential to me as a teenager, so. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking when you're going through <laughs> meta and, yeah, and uh, you know, like, what's your favorite scary movie? We're having a conversation, a bigger conversation sure. around a really fun scare. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, we showed the illustrations, but maybe we want to go back and if you have anything to say about them, I don't, but we just to see them a little bit longer. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. So, yeah, this is one of the characters looking through a stereoscope, which were hugely popular um, in the Victorian era, but then on into the 20th century. And it plays a role in the novel. There's a real sort of um, some plot elements with this. Um, with characters and these sapphic stereo view cards, um, many of which we were talking before we got on live. I, I found, I've sought out and sort of ordered from eBay. I'm the one that's bidding on the antique stereo sapphic view cards of, um, you know, women sort of like kissing or kind of holding each other in a hammock. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really fun to play with these and to think about um, the characters having these and having access to them. And um, I love that this ended up in there. There's also this great kind of figure drawing of a stereoscope if you're not familiar, um, but they were hugely, hugely popular. I kind of think of them as like the early Instagram of the day, right? Like a way to sort of feel like you were visiting a place and seeing these worlds from your, your drawing room or whatever. Um, and then I think the other illustration you have maybe is a yellow jacket, which I mentioned before, they have a big role in the novel. And this is actually uh, one of the actresses, it's her tattoo that she gets, her rendering of a yellow jacket um, and this Latin essay quam videri, it's, um, it means to, to be and not to seem. And that obviously this idea of illusions and surfaces and, and what we're showing versus what's the reality plays a big part in the novel, but um, the tattoo plays a role too. She gets this tattoo after she signed on to production and uh, it references a number of things and it's sort of a strange moment in the novel. Why has she gotten this tattoo? Um, so. Now, I know we have some viewer questions, but Virginia Laney, do we want to maybe do a reading right now or do we want to do oh, questions? Well, right? well, we do a, yeah. little, just a brief reading and then there's a bunch of questions, a bunch of love. And in fact, there is a question about the illustrations. So we'll get oh, to all those. Yeah. So what do you say, you guys? Lady, we'll do the reading and then go to the questions. It's, okay. it's super brief. I will not read a long time at all. So uh, this is, um, to set this up. It's uh, one of the, we're in the historic section. This is a character named Eleanor Faderman, um, who's the, the second of the classmates that, that's cursed, that gets the book, gets the copy of the book. Um, and I think the only thing you need to know about her other than she's, she's stolen this copy of the book, she now has the cursed copy of the book, um, is that she works in the orangery. She works in the school's greenhouse uh, in the mornings, kind of tending to the plants before school starts. It is said that after she stole the book found near their bodies, the copy of Mary McLean's book gone missing, Eleanor Faderman changed. Of course, every student at Brocons that year felt changed by what had happened to Flo and Clara, and the faculty felt the same. Some traditions, like the typically hours-long Halloween game of Witch in the Woods, were abandoned, considered too sinister to be held in the shadow of their deaths. More generally, for weeks after, the campus was hushed, the students tentative with one another and even with themselves. But Eleanor's change was both more acute and more specific. She became first enchanted by and then rather obsessed with Mary McLean's words, which is to say, careful readers, with Mary McLean's thoughts and prejudices, her desires and complaints, 
at least as Mary presented them in her portrayal. No more spying on Grace O'Connell, no more fingers sticky with stolen lime juice. Now Eleanor rushed through her tasks. She overwatered, underwatered, pinched good growth with bad as she clumsily twisted rotten leaves from stems. She even ignored the spider mites and white flies, the mealy bugs and caterpillars, each determined to eat of and burrow in the plants she was supposed to be caring for. All so she could get back to the red book and take it from its hiding spot and get back to her own behind the planter of Angel's Trumpet so that she could wander the barren hills of Butte, Montana with Mary McLean as she beseeched the devil to come and rescue her. I am a selfish, conceited, impudent little animal, it is true, but after all, I am only one grand conglomeration of wanting. And when someone comes over the barren hill to satisfy the wanting, I will be humble, humble in my triumph. Mary McLean. That's just a taste of Eleanor and the book and her obsession with it. So I love Eleanor. She does, she's not in the, in the novel very often, but I think she's for very long, but I think she's my favorite. So I'm happy to give her a little screen time. That's a great That's shout wonderful. out. Yeah. So um, should we jump into a few questions, you guys? We're, well, Katie, Katie Stover, Kansas Public Library, Kansas City Public Library, so many comments from Katie, hilarious. Um, and she has comments and thoughts and questions. Uh, she says that um, the final uh, chapters are scary as, am I allowed to say it? Probably, Fun. almost certainly. <laughs> um and uh you know she's she's so cool uh so she's just loving it there's lots of uh <laughs> wendy wilson bartlett says uh blair witch scared the bejesus out of her so we're going back to the to the beginning and talking about uh yellow jackets and such um so let's see um katie says can you guys see my thing keeps being stuck here uh she says it occurs to me that the that the book this one most reminds me of is Erin Morgenstern's Starless Sea. Mm. Um, she goes on to say that it was the language and characters and shifts in character point of view, meta elements. Um, and uh, yeah, so this, she's just, she just keeps popping up with comments and thoughts about this book uh, because it's just got her, it's got her doing a deep, doing a deep read. Um, let's see. Do you guys see some other questions? Um, she says, as far as like a sort of a reader's advisory, she would give plain bad heroines to the Morgan Stern fans, but I'd tell them to look for the more sinister tone, the sly snarky humor of some of the characters, the twisty characters and unpredictable storyline. Um, Abby Burke wants to know, what was your experience with collaboration versus doing or work completely on your own, creatively speaking? Uh, it was really positive. Um, I think, again, maybe it might, might have been more difficult if we were both writing the book. I think that's, a, a, I, I think knowing my own tics and tendencies, I would have a, a harder time um, that, turning over the reins. But because Sarah was illustrating, it just felt really fruitful. Um, and it was a pleasure. I loved it. I loved seeing the way she saw the scenes. Um, and it, you know, and, or, or, and, and, and sometimes I would, you know, I would be adamant, like, no, that's not at all how that room should look right. Or that's not, um, the, the, <laughs> the orangery. I was like, it's gotta be lusher. It's very bad in there. Things are, it's over, you know, you've got more plants. And Sarah's like, there can't be more plants. And I'm like, no, oh, there have to be more leaves, you know? Um, the map took us forever. There's a map at the beginning that we really wanted. And that was one of the last illustrations that we did. And that took forever. Sarah hadn't really tried to do something like that. And I had big ideas and she kept, I remember several emails. I am not a cartographer. I'm like, I know, I know, I know. But, um, and she nailed it. She nailed it out of the park. It's exactly how I thought it should look, but no, it was, it was wonderful. It couldn't have, it couldn't have been more pleasurable for me. I think Sarah thought that I, worked really slowly i mean she would probably tell you if she were here like yeah i would you know and then and then emily would go away for six months and i wouldn't hear for her and that and that's completely true but i i just loved it it was really really great speaking of writing so Lindsay said you mentioned it took a long time to write the book but how long did it take you to write this book well you know when people say this and then and then you, you get quoted right and people are said you said eight years but um i certainly i wasn't working on it every day right but i i sold a version of the book in the summer of 2012. 
um, I sold, uh, it was, it was going to be a very, it was a very different version of the book, but the contemporary making of a horror movie storyline remained. That was, I mean, that was there. The entire historic portion of the book was not there. Um, and in trying to figure out, you know, I knew that the, the, they were going to be filming at this boarding school and trying to answer for myself the question of why is this abandoned boarding school cursed, the historic section got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and then I found myself only wanting to write that section of the book and it became clear that it was going to be a different kind of book. So, you know, I can say eight years, but it was eight years with like significant chunks of not working on it in between. But it was, um, it was a long process trying to figure it out. Um, another question from Katie Stover says, did, an edit, did the editor look at the length and say, hey, could you trim anything here? Please Certainly. Look? Yeah, this is a shorter book. version of the book, believe she said, it or not. She's actually saying that there's nothing extraneous here and she's, she's thrilled with the length. Oh, well, thank you. I love big books. I do. Um, I love it. You know, I do love a big twisty novel, especially a big twisty horror novel. I do. I like, obviously, I like nested fictions. Um, and uh, this kind, these kind of curly Q plots that circle in on. I mean, clearly, if you've read the book, you know that, that I enjoy these things. So I really love that. I love to kind of, I think, lose myself to that kind of a book. But I, I, I love all kinds of books. I love novellas too, you know. Um, um, yeah, and I think, yeah, that, you know, I, I, it is the book that I set out to write, but it is, it is a big book. And it, believe it or not, it was an even bigger book. I think it was like 750 pages. So, and it had entire kinds of sections. There was a whole wedding sequence. I mean, there are big portions of the book that changed once the book was sold in that like last, you know, year and a half of, of editorial work. So a I lot of things say, filled. I will say that people, we, I say like it, like I said, larger than life. But I wouldn't, I wanted more <laughs> than 600 pages. Like, Thank you. It, it doesn't seem, you know, it doesn't seem like that large. Yeah. And maybe it's, maybe it spellbound me. I don't know. But I just wanted to keep <laughs> flipping. And, it might and have cursed I you. Yeah, well, I that's, that's a, a chance I'm willing you, to take. Yeah, I think you talked to anyone who's read this book. They could have gone on for twice as long. Like it, it's just, you really lose yourself in it. So that's really uh, exciting. Time and length lose their meaning entirely. Um, <laughs> Did you hear Yellow Jackets kind of buzzing? Maybe you were lulled. I don't know. Completely <laughs> you, lulled. Haven't, yeah. you haven't been playing that in the background the whole time? <laughs> yeah. Emily and I were talking before this, and um, I think readers will read this, and now it's Yellow Jacket season. It and is. people will, will have, all have their own accounts of their Yellow Jacket hauntings because it just happens. I was telling Chris that people are already life. sending me like, yeah, photos and blaming me for like, I got stung. <laughs> we have some really good friends who are like the only friends we've seen during the pandemic at a safe outdoor socially distanced space. And they came from gardening the other day and they were like three stings, right? And I'm like, I have nothing to do. You cannot blame me for every yellow. Is this not this also supposed to be the year of the murder wasp? Like I obviously cannot be blamed for all of them. Well, Oh, but yeah. I, I do love that I'm getting texts now of people anytime you know they encounter a yellow jacket and they've read the novel and <laughs> first thing come to mind. Well, all you have to I do know. is get, get that no, like notification. So from years in the future, anytime right. there's a thing, they're like, got to read that book again. Really gotta, mm -hmm. gotta, yeah, well. I think it's flattering that they, that they think that you have such control. You know, <laughs> Controlling the yellow jackets. Yeah, yeah just take absolutely, it. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, um, we did have the question, speaking of the jacket and the illustration before, and it, uh, there is a question here from Joe Jones, um, who says, will we ever see the illustrations that did not make it in the book? I think mm -hmm. maybe, I think maybe, yeah. There's a few, I'll have to talk to Sarah about that. We wanna do something with them, but maybe at, at, you know, at the very least get them up on my website or something, but um, I know I'm doing a takeover on Friday, so maybe, on the Instagram, there could be like, like maybe one. I'll have to talk to Sarah, but yeah, there's a handful. I mean, I would, I think she'll she'll have to go back in the archives because I'm. Some probably wouldn't even make sense, which might be kind of fun. But there, you know, there's got to be at least half a dozen that aren't in it. Good plug because let's remind everybody: you're Friday taking over our Instagram account, Harper Library. So exciting, and I've already. Uh, yeah, so that's maybe a little sneak peek uh, if they can get some illustrations. There are some so. real uh, Rhode Island locations that I very much fictionalized, but that are in the novel, including an actual Spite Tower that is in Little Compton, oh, wow. Rhode Island. With a different story, uh, but I'm, I intend to, to get some good shots of that to share. So, yeah. 
Awesome. Well, everybody tune in on Friday all day because we'll, you'll be able to see these posts and a video of your writing space. So Harper Library, you can follow us now and you'll, you'll see it come up. I'll post a link in our comment section as well. Um, I do want to read this question from Julia Earhart. Uh, she says, is the name Faderman a reference to Lillian Faderman? I love and commend you for providing so much commentary on the invisibility of lesbians in history. It is absolutely a nod to Lillian Faderman. And we've spoken a little bit about the book. I'm going to send her a copy. I just wanted to let her know that I had done that. But yes, she's one of the first, um, the first, uh, uh, I think, like, uh, sapphic historians that I read in undergrad and then have you know read everything um, that she's ever written and certainly Odd Girls and Twilight Lovers is a classic on my shelf but um, but I you know there's a bunch of, of Faderman's work that I think found its way into the book so um, yeah it's a very direct and intentional nod and celebration of her. Also work. one of the best covers Odd Girls and Twilight Lovers. Oh my gosh is it not so good? It's yeah. just such a yeah that's it's fantastic but surpassing the love of men was um, really useful too um, and especially in, in, in terms of finding some other sources that I ended up uh, uh, using for the book um, about women's colleges and, and boarding schools and some of the rituals that would take place at the turn of the century so. Very cool. Very cool. I don't know, you guys. I think, I think we got to all the questions. I hope that we did. Yes. Well, you can always, if you think of one before Friday, you can always write to Emily on Instagram. So Certainly. if you have another chance um, and be sure to tune in for that. And I guess before we log off, I just want to say thank you for talking to us. And I just have to say how much I like, thank you for writing this book. I think it will totally pull you anyone in if you haven't read it go get an e-galley on that galley or edelweiss now because it's so smart and um so much to dive into but also just so funny and i i think i just i commend you on it so congratulations thank you so amazing. much and thank you for having me this has been really fun thank you thank you so much congratulations emily on on all of the, the praise the love the reviews it's just so exciting and we're so happy for you and we're so proud to be publishing this book. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and the book goes on sale on uh, October 20th. And of course, everybody who uh, wrote in a question will send you a book. And um, as Lainey said, there's an Instagram takeover on Friday. So Joe Jones, you can check out more illustrations. Some really cool stuff going on there. <laughs> and can we just do one quick shout out to the door behind you one more time? Ah, yes. Rocky Neck Yacht and Vessel Corp. <laughs> and that's the coolest thing. The door behind me. <laughs> I think that it sounds like a good title. title. It sounds like a really great novel title. Yeah, the door behind me. And there's your jacket. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'll see you in eight years. Yeah. <laughs> the door behind me. Craigslist <laughs> metaphysical uh, horror. Book, yes. Door behind me. Oh. Um, did you ever call the phone number that's on the door? I have not. I have not. We should do it right now. Two eight three. I don't, I don't know the area code for oh, Boston, but Google right. would be helpful with that. So. All right. So maybe oh. on Instagram on Friday, you'll have called it up, and God knows who you'll I get. Can't. I'll be like, I'm the only person that has my car. <laughs> in my truck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh well, take good care. Thank and, you. Uh, you too. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. See you Friday. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>